Well, ladies and gentlemen, hello again. Welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name is Graham, and we're going to be taking a look at the uh, LET L410 UVP-E. It's the uh, Turbo LET model for X-Plane 10 by a developer called uh, Mihaly Alberti. I do hope I pronounced his name correctly. Uh, apologies if I haven't. It's a freeware model. It's one of the uh, first freeware models. In fact, it is the first freeware model I downloaded for X-Plane 10. And it was uh, one of the uh, one of the reasons I decided to take a look at X-Plane 10 in the first place. Uh, I mentioned previously I, I really wanted to fly the IXEG 737, but uh, knowing this model was available for free at uh, xplane.org was uh, was one of the reasons I chose X-Plane 10. Well, the reason uh, it had such an appeal is I've spent uh, quite a few hours sitting down the back of these little aircraft uh, back and forth uh, around the UK. Uh, not a lot of people know that uh, the LET 410 is operated by a company called Van Air Europe. You can see them here. Uh, based out of the uh, Isle of Man, Ronaldsway Airport, they operate across to uh, Belfast City, up to Glasgow, across to Newcastle, uh, down to Blackpool and uh, indeed Gloucester. And I believe they go into the Channel Isles as well. They've been operating for a number of years now, operating under the guise of a, a ticket seller by the name of, uh, initially by the name of Manx 2, before becoming a city wing a few years ago. Uh, so I've spent a little bit of time sitting down the back of this aircraft. It's an unpressurised uh, turboprop, uh, cruises along 68,000 feet and uh, just around 160, 170 knots. Uh, it's, it's fascinating, it's almost like uh, really old world aviation. There's no cabin crew, there's no toilets, uh, you get on the aircraft and the in-flight entertainment consists of a flat screen TV mounted on the front bulkhead and uh, they show silent movies. You, you can't obviously have any uh, any audio, so there's these silent movies uh, they show for the duration of the flight. It's really quite a throwback and uh, quite entertaining in its own right. Let's have a look at it in the, uh, in the simulator. So here we are, X-Plane 10. It's uh, just about uh, late summer, summer evening. The uh, weather's nice and clear tonight. We're going to be flying uh, from Blackpool in northwestern England. Blackpool, you can see this is Morecambe Bay here, Blackpool. And uh, one of the things you'll notice straight away about Blackpool uh, compared to my previous videos is it's uh, one of these airports that X-Plane doesn't have any buildings for any scenery. It's got the, uh, the 2D scenery, the runway layouts there, the taxiways are there, but there's no buildings. You can see from the OpenStreetMap data that this is where the terminal would be, but uh, it's uh, rather sparse and unpopulated. Uh, I thought I'd show this uh, airport just as a, a contrast to some of the previous uh, airports we've been looking at in the videos. But uh, let's not dwell on that. One of the, uh, the things about X-Plane is it's an uh, extraordinary sim for flying as well. So here's the model of the uh, of the LET 410. This is in its original uh, Manx 2 livery before it was repainted as a city wing. You sometimes see them flying with uh, tip tanks fitted. You can put little tip tanks on here. It gives it an uh, increased range. But uh, for the most part, this is, uh, this is the aircraft. You see, it's a fascinating little aircraft. On the inside, well, it would be the first officer's job to uh, close the door once they're in. Uh, all the customers on board, first officer would walk up to the front of the aircraft and uh, basically he would give the uh, the safety briefing. This little TV screen fitted here in the real aircraft. Uh, it's only 17 seats, no toilet compartment. And uh, this this model, this kind of reflects the uh, the material you see in the aircraft in real life. Um, it's I've been exposed to quite a little bit of um, freeware on uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator and uh, this was the first one I had a look at. I watched a few videos before downloading it and it really is uh, quite nicely modelled. Um, it doesn't purport to be uh, fully implemented at the moment as far as uh, systems go but it does have the new uh, X-Plane uh, GNS 430 and it's got enough to have a, a good stab at flying the aircraft and using some uh, clicking a few switches getting the aircraft going. So with that said, let's get the aircraft uh, up and running. Do this as quickly as we can, uh, as usual. First thing I want to do is to uh, turn on the batteries and we'll put on the uh, nav uh, radio just so we can get the um, get the GPS programmed. Uh, position lights are on outside, let's just double check. There we go. And uh, back on the inside, we've got the uh, an initiator cells here. This would be the left engine. You've got uh, the uh, flight systems, electrical systems, and the right engine. Here's the GNS 430. This is an improvement from previous versions of X-Plane. We can click it here 
it brings up in a, a 2D window, which is really quite useful. Um, it's not fully featured, it's not like uh, Reality XP uh, from uh, Flight 7 uh, X, where it uses the um, uh, the Garmin simulator. This has been implemented uh, directly within X-Plane. That being said, it's got more than enough to, uh, to keep us going today. So it will load the route. Uh, it uses the manipulator technology that uses the uh, scroll wheel, which is really quite useful. Uh, so we'll load uh, Blackpool, uh, E-G-N-H. The interesting ways to remember Blackpool is November Hotel, Naughty Holidays, if you're familiar with, uh, with the uh, Blackpool seafront, you'll, uh, you'll understand that. We're going to take the, uh, the routing out, but the uh, Whiskey to Delta uh, routing, uh, it's one of these uh, advisory routes. I don't know if that's still current. Uh, it certainly was uh, a few years ago, that would be the, the routing the aircraft would take. Uh, I know the uh, advisory routes have been changing recently. Um, GNS 430, as in real life, you can enter uh, the uh, airways directly. We'll have to put some waypoints in. But uh, to be honest, that's no drama. So we'll put uh, Morby in there. Just quick check, it's going the correct direction. It's a reasonable distance. So that is the waypoint we're looking for. Uh, we'll put Remsey in there as well. And uh, yeah, let's have a look. I used this um, this very uh, GPS unit quite a bit during my uh, IR uh, training in the UK. Um, it's not the, the best user interface in the world, even on the, the real, um, the real uh, GPS. It's uh, it's a bit clunky. There's lots of knobs. It's it's very much a product of uh, mid 90s uh, user interface design. That being said, it does the job. Uh, just there's a few traps in it. You've got to watch out for. Uh, so only a few waypoints to load. Um, at this point, you really wish there was a numeric keypad uh, as uh, some of the Garmin G1000 fits have. But uh, there we go. So Morby, Ramsey, Fannin. Reasonable distances there. So it all looks correct and uh, going to uh, Ronald's Way on the Isle of Man. That's EGNS. There we go. Uh, and because we are going to be doing uh, the flight uh, single pilot, what I'll do is I'll select the approach that we plan to use at the moment as well. It's going to be ILS arrival onto runway 26 with vectors and we'll load that in. Uh, it's going to tell us to set the uh, the course correctly. What I want to do is to make sure I've got the correct leg activated. Uh, if I can remember how to do that, activate leg. So it's taking us from uh, Blackpool out towards Morby. Course of 300, we'll set uh, 300 in the uh, on the uh, HSI here. We're going to be departing off runway 28 at, uh, at Blackpool. So we'll put the heading on there as well. Um, on the uh, VOR front, uh, 112.2, that's the uh, frequency for the Isle of Man uh, VOR. Uh, so we'll make sure that we've got uh, the VOR selected on this. I think it will show it on a, a single uh, needle. There we go. And it's about 63 miles away. So it should be really quite a nice short flight. Uh, that's us finished with the uh, GPS. All that remains to do is to start the aircraft up. So what we'll do is uh, turn the uh, limiting units on. Uh, we want to have the starting switches on, the batteries are already on. Uh, we need to have the uh, beacon light on. What else do we need? Fasting seatbelt signs would be useful. And uh, we need to have the fuel pumps and probably the cross feed on to start the aircraft. That looks, uh, looks quite reasonable. Just have a quick check on the outside, make sure that everything is as it, is as it should be. There we go. Okay, so we've got the uh, pro uh, the thrust levers here, uh, propeller control levers, make sure they're fully forward. Uh, I've got keystrokes bound to those and the fuel control levers. So we'll start the engines, flip this cover up here, and uh, hopefully if I've pushed all the buttons we can start number two. It's an electric start on these uh, Walter engines. Push and hold till it starts. You can see the gas generator spinning up. Guessed about 30% and uh, we'll push the uh, lever forward, push the fuel in. There we go. You can see the uh, propeller RPM coming up and the uh, temperature is good. Very quick start and that's uh, quite realistic to the, the real aircraft as well. I always remember it's uh, they start the engines up and taxi off within uh, what seems like seconds. Let's start number one.
Okay, put the fuel in. Again, we're not looking at a, a very uh, a fully detailed system simulator, but there's enough levers to, to give it some interest as well. So, propellers coming up. Temperatures are good and torque's good. Let's uh, close that over. Uh, we're finished with the starters just now. Ooh, yeah, there's a... Okay, can we close it? Yes, we can. Uh, on the overheads, we'll put the generators on now. Uh, we've got the... Uh, DC and AC generators on, we'll put the inverters on. The manual of the documentation that comes with this is really rather good. It, uh, it tells you what features are enabled uh, and what's really just there for show. A lot of the uh, electrical uh, consumer switches here are just for show at the moment. But as uh, Mahili says in his video, it's fun to switch and who am I to disagree? So we'll switch them all on. Uh, put on the additional equipment here. We've got the... Uh, ice detector on there. Uh, interesting, it's got taxi uh, light and uh, landing light in the nose. They call them search lights and there's a three minute lin uh, limit on the uh, on the uh, landing light. So I use the uh, taxi light just now. I set flaps uh, 18, that's the first stage of flaps. There's only two uh, on this uh, aircraft and we'll set the trim to about uh, plus two. One of the um, interesting things about it is it is fitted with a representation of this uh, STEC uh, 55X. Um, I don't know if the real aircraft would uh, would have had that uh, fitted. I don't remember them having autopilots uh, when I flew on them. Uh, one of them has an Alshid alerter fitted up here. Uh, this aircraft uh, or this model doesn't have that at the moment. But uh, I emailed Mihaly and uh, I believe the uh, Alshid alerter is on one of the desired features. What I'm going to do is set the uh, VS to plus 800. Um, we don't have a second pilot in this aircraft, uh, obviously in the sim, so the autopilot is going to be used a little bit more than it would be on the real aircraft just to uh, make life that little bit easier. Set a transponder code. Um, I'll use my favourite 45601. Set the transponder to on before we taxi. And uh, let's have a look. What do we have? We've got these, uh, this uh, isolation valve. I've not been able to find an explanation for that, but at uh, low power settings, that seems to be uh, seems to be on most of the time. Have a look around the outside. There we go. It's got the uh, taxi lights. I think it's a really nice looking model. Um, from a distance, it, uh, it looks good. Up close, it looks really, really pretty good as well. We'll taxi off. I'll release the parking brake. Obviously, making sure there's nobody around. It's unpressurized. These uh, windows here are just perspex. You can actually open these, and uh, I've seen them pass the uh, the final flight documents through uh, the window before setting off. Quick brake check. It just needs a, a tiny amount of power to get rolling here. One of the interesting things with these aircraft when they're operating at uh, Ronald Sway and uh, Glasgow, a place like that, is that they don't use a pushback tug. They, they park on stands that are uh, designed for much bigger aircraft. Uh, these really are quite uh, quite small little machines. Um, so they do uh, a terminal turn, I believe it used to be called. You drive the aircraft onto the stand and then turn around so the aircraft can drive uh, straight off again. Um, used to be very common. You see pictures uh, from places like Heathrow back in the 1960s with the old uh, uh, Viscounts and Vanguards and Trident 2s uh, all doing uh, the terminal turns so they could uh, drive off. These days pushbacks are a lot more common. So just taxiing out to Blackpool runway 28. Again it's um, it's not detailed ground scenery as I said but there's uh, there is a runway and there's taxiways that are representative so uh, if you're going to be using X-Plane for uh, uh, training uh, and you were based out of Blackpool then you've got enough really to work with there. Um, if you were flying around just for recreational purposes then you can have a look for uh, some external scenery. There is uh, a couple of uh, scenery add-ons available for Blackpool. Uh, it needs a few extra libraries. I've decided just to stick with the uh, plane uh, X-Plane for this video. So what we're looking at in this video is just basically having a look at the aircraft itself. Uh, I, I'm not using uh, 
any specific procedures uh, for the LEP 410, uh, we're just going to have a look at the, uh, the aircraft getting airborne, flying out towards the Isle of Man, and uh, with a bit of luck, we'll do a, a raw data uh, instrument arrival onto runway 26. Uh, it doesn't have flight directors, there's uh, no flight director bars on here, so if you're flying it manually, you're flying it on, on raw data. It's really quite uh, enjoyable. No air traffic today, we'll work on the basis we are cleared to line up and uh, backtrack, runway 28. So Blackpool uh, main runway, it's about uh, 1,800 metres long. Uh, the UVP-E in the uh, aircraft's name, I believe, uh, refers to short takeoff and landing. We'll use nothing like the full length of the runway. So I mentioned I've uh, pre-armed the autopilot there for uh, holding 800 feet per minute. Quick glance down here, you'll see that the uh, VSI is calibrated in meters per second, so 800 feet a minute would be about 400 meters per second. And uh, it's kilometers as well, but that's no drama. I mean, it's uh, the only thing about this aircraft for uh, learning instrument flying really is compared to the standard Western layout, the altimeter and the uh, VSI are in the opposite uh, positions. And you've got the uh, RMI indicator here rather than a, a gyro you'd have on a, a vacuum powered uh, arrangement. So that's almost certainly enough runway. Just uh, slows down. Turn around. What we'll do is just bring it to a halt on the runway, set the brake, just have a look around to make sure that we've uh, done everything we should have done. We've got the uh, limiter for the uh, torque turned on there, everything else is set. Uh, we've got some uh, panel lights we could maybe click on just to. Uh, make things a little bit brighter in here. There we go. There we go. Right. Excellent. So, parking brakes released. Work on the basis for a clear to take off. And uh, interestingly, on this aircraft, the speeds don't really change depending on the, the weight you've got, and it carries a rather modest variation in weights, rotating about 140 odd kilometres per hour. Comes up really quite quickly. Pitch the aircraft looking for about 10 degrees nose up initially. It's positive climb, gear up. So above 500 feet, uh, the book says we can retract the flaps. I'll do that. I keep the climb going just now, holding about plus 10. What we'll do now is uh, we want to start reducing the thrust. So rather than fly the thing manually and mess around with the systems, I'm just going to pitch to try and achieve that uh, roughly that 800 feet per minute. And I'll click the autopilot in. I've got a keystroke for that as well. Oh, there we go. Autopilot should be in there. Uh, the other thing we'll do is just to make life a little bit easier, stick it into heading mode and uh, turn that towards the intercept there. So bringing the power back now, looking for about 80% uh, on the torque. The auto feather light comes out there and I'll bring the propellers back to about uh, 1900. Here's the propellers down here. Looking up on the overhead, uh, I'll leave those tax lights on uh, all the time. Uh, what can we turn off? We can turn off the uh, auto feathering and uh, automatic bank control. This little aircraft's actually got uh, spoilers as well, which is quite interesting, uh, but we'll not be using those just now. Uh, so let's have a look. Just bring the heading around a little bit. Uh, we can bring that up to have a look at it. We've got the uh, map display as well, but uh, just fly it on the heading initially. Let's have a look on the outside. You see, it's uh, it looks like a a really nicely detailed model on here. Um, I believe there's plans to make this a, a payware payware model as uh, the quality improves on it. But uh, to be honest, for what we we're getting for free, it's it's really quite enjoyable. Um, yeah, there's not a lot wrong with the model. 
So we don't have uh, Altitude uh, Alert or Altitude Capture on this. Uh, the SDEC implementation here is very uh, primitive uh, implementation of the autopilot. Uh, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. It's um, I believe it's just using some of the standard X-Plane logic. It's more than enough for what we want. It's a, a virtual co-pilot to, to fly the aircraft while we mess around with the systems. The CDI, yeah, HSI bar centre there, so we could probably put it into nav mode now. It'll do a reasonably good job at uh, capturing that track out towards uh, Morby. Again, I'll bring the heading uh, into alignment. If you find uh, you've got difficulty to get rid of this uh, GPS, the thing that surprised me is um, I can move it around up here, but I can't get rid of it. To get rid of it, I've got to click down on the 3D panel here. I've got some. Uh, custom uh, viewpoint set up um, uh, for the uh, pilot and the uh, co-pilot co -pilot side so we can see all the initiators and uh, the systems as well. Also got a kind of centre view here but more usefully uh, is a, a kind of IFR view. I want to show you a lovely detail on this uh, as well. If I move that view around, you see the, uh, uh, the uh, slip ball here is nicely centred in the uh, middle of the wires there. If I move the viewpoint off the right, you can actually see the parallax error um, with the ball sitting ahead of the, uh, the little wires. I thought that was a, a nice detail on here. I've offset the view a little bit so I can see the torque gauges on this side and the uh, flying instruments on this uh, on the left hand side. So being unpressurised we want to be aware of the uh, rate of climb uh, with regards to our customers ears as well. Uh, going up at 800 feet per minute should present no really, uh, not really, uh, no, no problems at all. What I want to do is level off about uh, 6,000 feet. Ah, shouldn't. Uh, I don't believe the uh, fuel cross feed is uh, functional on this, but it probably wasn't a good idea to take off with the cross feed open. So we have that closed. I knew I'd miss something on this. Let's have a look. So one of the interesting things about this uh, autopilot implementation, and, and I think it's just down to the, uh, the basic X-Plane logic, is if I was to click that into alt mode at the moment, it would capture. Uh, and on normally on the uh, 55X, once the aircraft's in level flight, if I rearm vertical speed, it'll capture the vertical speed the aircraft is currently doing. So if it's flying level, push VS and it'll give you VS zero. Uh, on this model here, if I push VS, it'll give me whatever was last selected in there. Uh, in actual fact, this uh, VS adjusting wheel is still live even when it's not displayed on the window there. So that means if we uh, capture using the uh, alt mode and then go back to VS to go downhill at the other end, uh, it'll start to climb straight away. Um, the developer is aware of it as, a, as an issue. It's added to the list of uh, fixes. To be honest, we can work around it. It's dead easy. We'll just level off by backing the VS down to zero and then capturing alt. It's a, a nice easy workaround that gives us um, no, uh, no dramas whatsoever. I spent a lot of time flying single engine aircraft a lot. Uh, across the uh, stretches of water you see here and uh, it's always a little bit uh, disconcerting to have all that water around you and just a, a single light homing powering you along. Much more pleasant to have uh, two turbines uh, on the wings. So we're doing 800 feet a minute uh, climbing towards uh, 6,000. What I'll do is just uh, reduce that down a little bit and about 500. nice night. There's uh, no icing, uh, no dramas on here. We could put the windshield heat on if required and the pitot heaters are over here. That's functional as well as the uh, airframe icing but uh, not a drama tonight. There's 6,000 feet so I'll bring the VS down to zero and then capture alt. Now this is an interesting thing and this kind of mirrors real life here as well. The Garmin was uh, flashing up a message there. It says set course to 283. Um, the HSIs are usually capable of encoding the course selection and sending it to the uh, GPS, but with this being mechanical, 
What the uh, Garmin can't do is uh, slave the HSI. If you've got an electronic HSI, like uh, some of the Sandell instruments, uh, they can be slaved automatically uh, or centered automatically. But on the Garmin, it, it knows what it's uh, set to. You can see if I move it around, it gives me the message if it's not in the correct location. And uh, I believe that's uh, very true to the uh, real life functionality as well. So here we are, 6,000 feet. Let's have a look at the, uh, the map. There we go. To calculate the descent, uh, I want to use a, a continuous uh, VS profile uh, just to be aware of the pressurization. Um, we'll, have a, we'll plan for 3,000 feet and uh, I want to be level 3,000 feet about uh, 10 miles before Ronald's Way. EGNS that would be. So if I do this, there we go. Uh, and that says that I need to descend about uh, 360 feet a minute at the moment. I'm going to leave it till it says about uh, 500 and then we'll start downhill. There's various different strategies for calculating the descent. Um, constant VS is, is one way. Uh, we know from here we're going to descend at uh, 500 feet a minute. We're at 6,000 feet, so 12 minutes before we arrive would be a, a good time to start the descent. Um, various different ways to, to achieve the same goal here. On the real Garmin you can change the uh, fields that you've got displayed here so it's quite useful uh, maybe not having maybe not having the track in there once you've got it loaded but having the um, having the time overhead as well uh, and you've got estimated time on route uh, that's towards Remsey uh, you can have uh, estimated time of arrival as well displayed uh, I don't think on this one you can change the data fields you can turn the fields on and off on this uh, screen but maybe not so much uh, on here there you go. I've left the uh, taxi light on um, all the way across. The reason for that is uh, we're basically outside controlled airspace here. It's an advisory routing, um, but there, there could be other traffic not participating. Over the North Sea, there's uh, quite a, uh, sorry, over the Irish Sea, there's quite a bit of um, military activity at uh, lower levels. There's also some uh, gas rigs uh, out there with helicopters uh, supporting those. Shouldn't be an issue at 6,000 feet, but we'll just make ourselves a little bit more visible by running the taxi light instead. So the Garmin's actually uh, quite clever. It knows that we've got the um, the approach. Uh, it, it knows which approach we're going to do. So when it goes to the uh, terminal guidance mode, it will tune the ILS frequency and the standby here. Um, one of the things I mentioned on my previous videos is that uh, one the, a particular challenge in flying the sim is operating single pilot. Um, and it's not even so much single pilot. Um, it's the fact that you're there all by yourself. Things that would uh, be very routine in the real world such as getting radar vectors from an air traffic controller it's got a lovely radar display with distances and uh, radials and everything to get you onto the final approach track we really don't have that um, the best we've got is really the uh, Garmin's map display here um, but there, there are a couple of things we can do to resolve that I think it's about to sequence the next waypoint 283 should be more or less a straight line there we go so what I'm going to do is, uh, just to move things along a little bit, I'm going to centralise the heading bug, uh, where we are just now. I'm going to put the um, autopilot into heading. Okay, uh, once I've done that, um, I know that I can make changes to the uh, navigation uh, system and the, or the GPS system, and the aircraft's not going to change from what it's doing. So I'm going to activate the approach and if I then have a look on the map, you see that that takes me out to uh, essentially a six mile final. Uh, that solves any of my vectoring issues. It's quite convenient uh, to be able to do that just now. It's asking me to set the uh, heading of uh, 295. There we go. And uh, we'll stick it into nav again. The aircraft's going to make that turn. We'll have a look and see how that affects our VNAV as well. So 3000, that was a good uh, stab in the dark for Ronald's way. But uh, we could probably change that around and uh, six mile final, 2,000 feet platform, and uh, I want to basically be level uh, two miles before, just to give me time to configure and slow down. And in this case, it's going to be the, uh, let's see, India Romeo Yankee 6. There you go. So to achieve that, I actually need to start downhill just now. 
800 feet per minute. Shouldn't be a drama. So we'll come down here, select VS, and uh, because I pre-selected zero, it's uh, already there. I'll go for 800 uh, initially. Make sure the aircraft's responding. If there's any issues at all, um, this is calculated based on the, uh, the current ground speed we're achieving as well. So if I come back onto the uh, screen here, you see we're doing about 200 knots, so I'll just bring the power back a little bit. Uh, it's important to be aware of the uh, torque setting on this aircraft. If I bring the torque all the way back to zero, then that would be a, a bad situation. I don't know if the aircraft in real life has got uh, uh, flight idle locks to prevent you from doing that sort of thing, but for me, uh, I'll use about 20% as the minimum there. But uh, 40 will be more than enough. We'll start slowing down and we'll see that that'll have a, a reasonably good effect on the rate of descent required. It only needs about 700 feet per minute. So I'll keep that 800 uh, selected until it's down to uh, about 500. And we'll have a go at flying a, a raw data approach. Uh, let's have a look up here. We might need uh, full power at some point, so we'll uh, enable those as we get lower, the prop feather control and the uh, automatic bank control. I uh, don't need to start switches. I'll probably put the landing lights on for the arrival. Um, otherwise, that's it. It's quite, uh, quite a simple aircraft in real life, and the, the sim model does a, a good job at reflecting that as well. There isn't a switch uh, in the aircraft that seems to control the uh, wingtip strobe lights at the moment. Uh, if I, I've got a keystroke bound for it and I can uh, turn the uh, wingtip strobes on and off, but there's nothing on the overhead panel, so I don't know whether that's a, a small oversight or just something that's not behaving quite as expected. But uh, to be honest, it's, it's no drama. I'm quite happy with it uh, as it is. If we wanted to turn the strobes on and off, there's that uh, keystroke we can set there. So while we're descending, just keeping an eye on that, we can see that we've got uh, some limit speeds on here as well as a helpful conversion table. We're doing about 162 knots airspeed at the moment, which is fine. Flap limiting speeds, uh, flap 18, flap 42, 250 and 220. So if we say about uh, 230 and 200 might be a, a good schedule for that. Uh, I believe you can fly the approach at uh, 180 uh, kilometers an hour and then select final flap just as you get to minimums. One of the curiosities uh, on this aircraft, I don't know if it's the uh, uh, the same on, uh, on a lot of aircraft of this uh, era and origination, is that you uh, select the gear before you deploy the flaps. I'll tune up the uh, final uh, ILS frequency on there and uh, on the flight plan or on the procedure I shall uh, activate vectors to final. What that does on the map display, oh I should have gone to heading. I did say that previously and then neglected to do it, so that was a, a bad idea. On the uh, map display now, we see this magenta inbound line. And it says, set the course to 261, which is going to be the final track there. This button here is the uh, button that will cause you to fail your instrument test if you're flying with the GNS uh, 430. Uh, at the moment the CDI, uh, HSI sorry, is uh, driven from the GPS. It needs to be saying VOR localizer, otherwise you're, getting, uh, you're flying an ILS using uh, GPS guidance, which is not really the done thing. There we go. So we're coming up on 3,000 feet. I'm going to level at 2,000. Come in here, 13 miles. What we can do is, it's probably a good time to start flying the aircraft manually. So I'll click off the autopilot. Uh, let me just make sure everything's set. Uh, and I'll apologize uh, straight away for making a complete mess of this. It's, uh, it's been a long time since I did something uh, like this uh, in quite such a primitive aircraft in the grand scheme of things. But here we go, autopilot's coming out. I'll just reduce the uh, rate here. So I'm flying that uh, 300, that should be a good intercept heading. Obviously in, uh, in bigger aircraft, in busy airspace, we're trying to uh, continuous descent approaches to minimise uh, the noise footprint and uh, keep the aircraft at idle thruster as much as possible. Um, when you're doing this sort of thing, uh, it's maybe not uh, as important. Uh, first couple of times in the sim, we just want to, to get the feel of the aircraft, really. It'd be good practice at the moment to identify the... Um, ILS um, 
using the audio idents, and it's actually more relevant in X-Plane than it would first seem, because X-Plane has a habit of changing to the opposite end, ILS. Um, in the UK, uh, and it's quite common for the uh, ILS to have the same frequency on both ends, and their traffic controllers will only turn on at the end of the runway that's relevant. Um, whereas uh, X-Plane, it has both ends on, and it just turns on the ILS based on uh, where you're heading, really. So doing back course uh, localizers can be uh, quite tricky. There are ways around it, uh, I believe, but um, it's, it's not a drama at the moment. So I want it to be level. This uh, DME uh, on the uh, right-hand side of the screen there is uh, fairly realistic. Level aircraft here, 2,000 feet. Make some trimming. Make sure I've got a reasonable power setting selected there. 8 miles, so 2 miles to run. There's the localizer. We'll roll. Uh, I don't have enough hands at the moment to set the heading bug, so we'll just, uh, we'll just do our very best here. Uh, 2,000 feet I want to maintain. Let's uh, see how that looks there. There's 250, no, uh, 250 uh, kilometers. Light slope is uh, coming down, so we should be okay to select the gear just now. There we go. Oh, bit of pitch change there. Always trim the aircraft. It's actually quite hard in, uh, in any simulator to get the, the trim quite right because you don't have the same feel as you would normally. There's the glide slope. I'll select the first stage of flaps and push the nose down a little bit. Uh, it's quite difficult with it calibrated in meters per second, uh, but I'm looking for about uh, 2.5. That'd be around 500 feet a minute for 100 knots or so. Just sitting slightly below the, uh, the glide slope at the moment, but well within the IR tolerances really. And uh, I want to have a power setting uh, in there and not really mess around with the power. If I've got a, a good power setting, then minimising the changes of that uh, is going to make it a little bit easier to fly the ILS. Obviously, in real life, we'd have done a, a full briefing, talked about minimums, go arounds, that sort of thing. That's just for fun in the sim. So hopefully it'll all work out quite nicely. But the big picture stuff, if we do go around to the south of the airport, there's uh, no train, we're out over the water for about uh, 30 miles or so. Setting slightly to the uh, right of the localizer, it's not really acceptable, but the, uh, I'll just correct that a little bit. The glide slope's looking good. It's trying to fly at a datum. I'm centralizing the, uh, uh, the attitude director there, uh, roughly where I want it, and making just little changes in heading. And uh, little changes in pitch to, to keep that going uh, on the glide slope. So it's about uh, 280 knots, uh, sorry, 180 km, uh, kilometers per hour. Uh, I really can't talk and fly raw data at the same time, so you'll have to apologize. I have to apologize for that. Otherwise, we're on the uh, on the localizer, on the glide slope. The speed is looking good. So when I select uh, full flap for landing, there's going to be quite a balloon uh, as we as we put all that flap out. But hopefully we shouldn't really need to make much of a power change. Uh, we'll make the flap selection really quite low. That's below 1,000 feet uh, radio. We could have a quick check out. There we go. That's a good thing. I'm relieved at that. We'll keep flying it down to, shall we say, down to about uh, 400 feet. Minimums would be about, uh, I guess, 200 uh, off this Cat 1 arrival. Interestingly, at Ronald's Way, if you approach the uh, other direction, runway 08, uh, it's quite an offset on the ILS, so the minimums are a little bit higher. Just get a little bit high on the glide slope there because I'm talking rather than flying. I'll try and sort that out. Maybe just bring the power off a little touch there. So we're going to use uh, 400 roughly as our sensible decision at the moment. 
That's 500. I look out the window. There we go. No flaps. Catch the uh, the balloon just that little bit. Retrim the aircraft. And there's Ronald's way. It's quite detailed scenery at Ronald's way. There's a, a runway extension carried out a few years ago, and uh, that is uh, current in the sim. So it, it looks different from the default scenery you'd have on the uh, Microsoft Flight Sim range. One thing I have noticed is the uh, Pappy lights and the uh, glide slope don't tend to, to match up that well. Uh, in real life there's uh, a little bit more uh, quality control, shall we say, put into the, uh, the lighting installations here. But no problems at all. Nicely on the centre line. Speed's looking good. Uh, we do have reverse thrust, won't be necessary today, just uh, ground idle is all we need. You hear the uh, power coming off, so it does tend, I think it does implement some kind of uh, ground idle versus uh, flight idle range. There go, there's the attacks uh, we lead off lights. Just spray gently now. The flights I've done on uh, on these aircraft, uh, when you taxi off the runway, there uh, seems to be quite a lot of uh, button clicking going on on the overhead panel. Um, I guess it's just removing the electrical uh, consumers that you no longer need. And uh, quite often they'll shut down one of the engines as well. But uh, today, uh, we'll avoid the distraction of doing that and just uh, drive the thing onto stand as it is. We've only got the taxi lights uh, selected. I, I didn't select the uh, landing lights. So another, more or less, a backwater airport. We've got uh, buildings and scenery, uh, just as the sim comes straight out of the box. I don't know if we've actually got the, uh, the stands drawn. I'll give you a quick cheat outside and have a look. Yeah, we've got the, uh, the stands all nicely boxed here. And uh, we'll see if we can do this terminal turn as well. Um, I'm going to cheat just that little bit. I'm going to turn off the uh, taxi lights. Uh, I'm going to use the outside view because uh, in real life you'd be marshalled with a, uh, a chap out there having a look at your wingtips as well. One of the simplifications is uh, we'll just have a look on the uh, the outside view. Obviously doing everything by yourself when normally there'd be a, a team of people looking after you. Um, differential power, maybe differential brake. Uh, we're going to struggle a little bit here. What I should have done is had the uh, number one uh, engine shut down by this point, and that would make life a little bit easier. Now if we park it uh, at an angle on the stand, it'll make it uh, nice and easy for the customers to get uh, get out. Anyway. Okay, set the parking brake, parked on the stand, that's a good thing. Let's have a look. So we'll shut down uh, some of the uh, electrical consumers first of all. We're kind of done with that. All that stuff there can go off. And uh, I'll leave the lights, get rid of the supplementary equipment. Uh, 
nice detector can go off. About, uh, oh, make sure the uh, pitot is turned off, pitot heating is turned off, and the windshield heats off. Okay, uh, we can probably shut the aircraft down. Uh, what else can we do? Uh, we're both having the generators off and uh, the inverters always should have gone off first of all. Generators off. There we go. And we'll shut down. Have a look outside. Spinning down. Engines are coming to a halt. We'll turn the beacon off. Uh, probably didn't turn the transponder off. Okay, so that's uh, how we've done everything. Yeah, it's all looking good. Uh, we'll leave the battery on so we've got the exit lights. We'll turn off the fast seatbelt signs. Go to the back, open the door, and uh, there we go. Uh, let 410 flight from Blackpool to the Isle of Man. A uh, little bit all over the place there with the uh, systems and procedures. I've not spent anywhere near as much time in this aircraft as uh, what one would really want to do before doing a, a flight for a reel in it if you like. But I hope you can see that it's a, a very nicely detailed model. Uh, a number of systems there to, to use uh, uh, and abuse and uh, it's really quite uh, enjoyable to operate. It's pretty good for instrument flying as well. Uh, HSI uh, is uh, quite well Im uh, implemented and the uh, attitude indicator is really pretty good. I showed you that parallax error on the uh, slip ball as well. So. There we go. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, all that remains to say is if you have any comments on the video, any questions on what you saw, uh, then please feel free to leave me comments in the video uh, notes. Uh, I'll put a link to uh, where to get the uh, LET410 in the, uh, the video description as well. Thanks very much for watching and uh, hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you.